fellow stopped on the corner of uh, 7th Avenue and 125th Street. And he asked the fellow, say, black fellow standing up. He said, um, uh, I, I need to go uh, downtown and uh, I want to go to Brooklyn. He said, how do I go? I don't know. He said, what's north? Which way is north? He said, I don't think I know. He said, which way is south? He kept fighting those streets, trying to eat from day to day and trying to find a way. He said, I don't know. He said, which way is west? He said, man, I don't know. He said, what do you know? He said, I'm not lost. <laughs> That was deep. <laughs> What is funk music? Musically, it's the bridge between 60s soul and 80s hip hop. It is an essential and underappreciated musical movement. Funk was born in the middle of America and spread east and west like a fever. Funk is discipline. Funk is freaky. Funk is spacesuits and Egyptian iconography. It is huge afros and crazy colors. It is Afro-futuristic, and it's always fun. At its core, funk is the expression of an idiosyncratic, creative, and visionary community of music makers. My name is Amir Questlove Thompson, drummer and leader of The Roots, and we're going to go on a journey back into time throughout history through your funky emotions as we go finding the funk. Funk for me is our life. Funk for me is the word that was spoke, and this is what funk is. I'd probably say it's rhythm and blues with uh, uh, with people that couldn't cuss, but they wanted to, it sounded like they wanted to cuss. It's black rock and roll. It's, it's when, when George said, we, we have returned to reclaim the pyramids, I, that's what that represents to me. Funk has a lot to do with the booty of music, which is like the backbeat, the dark keys, the, the pulse, and the thump of, of rhythm. But if you have to try to tell somebody, you have to start using words like syncopation and, and stuff like that, or it makes you dance, and it doesn't do it justice. We know it comes from the Congo, Lufuki, which means bad body odor. So what I love about some of these black musical terms like jazz, there are all these curse words or these obscenities that are derived from other languages applied to black culture. And what we do, is, you know, funk is like sonic chitlins. We work out all the nastiness and the grease and, and we take it and process it and make something out of it, something bad, body odor, into something beautiful. So you saw Africa writ large in funk music as a sound collage of the best of black identity. Funk is the ability to make anything yours. The root of all of the music comes out of New Orleans, but because, you know, we have the serious sounds from jazz and, and early rock and roll coming out of New Orleans, and the tradition of, of dance in New Orleans, there's nowhere else to go but the funk, especially with the second lines and, 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 and the rhythms of New Orleans. Um, you mix that with, with the jazz sound and rhythm and blues and, and you have the funk. Being in those marching bands from New Orleans where we grew up, funk is such an integral part of the drum section. We have to constantly clap. Blah, be on that beat with that funk, you know, clap, goom, clap, goom. That's where really it started, you know, that just that funk rhythm. Mainly when people talk about funk, they talk about a, a form of rhythm and blues music that became very popular in the late 60s and early 70s. They emphasized, uh, you know, explosive rhythm from the drums, from the bass, from guitar. A lot of arranged horn lines, and there are many sources for where the rhythms came from. Um, we could look at, say, the beginnings of funk. You go back to, say, Louis Jordan. 
from the 1940s, the jump bands that were, you know, the post big band era. My background is in jazz, or I should say my front ground. I first heard the word funk when I was listening to Hard Silver records. Hard Silver was using the word funky, like Filthy McNasty, some of his songs, and also Cannonball Adderley would talk about funk. And these guys would talk about that on their records when they did live recordings. So it wasn't James Brown that I got exposed to the word funk. It was like actually jazz. I mean, they, funky was something that we called Horace Silver and Art Blakey and even some Miles stuff. But there was funk jazz in the early 60s. And if you go back to old issues of Downbeat, you'll see stuff described as funky jazz. Well, with jazz, go back a generation and a half. With jazz, jazz had become really sophisticated as well. I mean, the jazz that was happening in the 60s, um, because uh, uh, of just the natural development of music, jazz had started in the 20s. So by the time you got to the 60s, 40 years later, jazz had become very, very comp complex. And then add to that the social aspect with the civil rights movement, you know what I mean, and the hippie movement and the challenging of everything in the 60s. Jazz had become something that it was really out there, you know what I mean? Um, and funk was a reaction to that. A lot of people don't know that James Brown it was an, is an organ player. And one of his best friends, uh, I mean, a lot of his best friends were jazz musicians. Oliver Nelson and him were, like, very close. So you get this thing, and I've always said, there's a, there's a wonderful mixture and coming together of jazz and R&B that when you examine a lot of the early uh, jazz guys or, or, or funk guys, you'll see that they have a, a deep jazz connection. James Brown, soul brother number one, was a fan of funky jazz and would have his band open his shows with instrumentals that would inspire a revolution. Soul music was really singing music, you know? It was about the vocalists and supporting vocalists. What happened with funk is that funk became more instrumental. It became more about the rhythm section, particularly, and the relationship between rhythm section and horns. And to some degree, singers not didn't come secondary, but the band became a bigger part of the show. Classic James Brown, of course, is the funky period, the soulful period, between 1966 and 1974. So between that period, you have uh, kind of the evolution of soul. And then it sort of morphs into uh, the beginning of funk, which is like, you know. The voice itself becomes, you know, in a beautiful rhythmic way, open to multiple and polyrhythms. And more time because we talk about they ain't got no lyrics. When, when they start sampling, what did they sample? <clears throat> it must be a lot of dope in that shit. You can put a ten on it. You can sample him, and then I can sample you, and somebody can sample me, and it still works. On stage, he would perform elongated versions of them, and the vamps were were a device to set up. Uh, really to give him a forum to do choreography with the Famous Flames. So it was really just a, a device to provide an opportunity to do dance routines. It wasn't really a musical thing. But eventually that became, that kind of, the, the script flipped. And all of a sudden it was like, hey, if we do this with this vamp, we do that, we build it up, we break it down, and all of a sudden you've got a new genre of music. Brown's band was full of razor sharp players who go on to have an enduring impact on pop culture especially Clyde Stubblefield, AKA the funky drummer. Coming from hip hop, being an MC, when we started digging through records, the first thing really we were looking for was what you'd call a, a raw or naked beat. Whoever would guess just this little riff would then kind of become a soundtrack in, uh, let's see, when would that have been? That would have been 19, 1989, you know, that another summer sound another of the funky, funky drama. drama. You know, it's, it, I don't think when Clyde Stubblefield played that in 1970, I guess what, 71, 70, maybe even 69, who would have guessed 20 years later that would be, he'd be the backing band for Chuck D. Every MC worth his green and salt, like this is what they wanted to rhyme with. 
Um, probably the, the, the best hip hop act that really utilized funky drummer to the hilt uh, was Public Enemy, who pretty much made this their, their rhyming bed. If James Brown was a saxophonist, he'd be Macy Parker. I mean, I mean, the, the, if anybody ever does a study of their DNA, it's got to be the same. I mean, somewhere, somebody's mama knew somebody because they're, they're, they're that, their musical spot, their sense of, of rhythm and time is so impeccably the same. As a college student, I was at a crossroad, you know, because I know everybody want to play jazz, you know, traditional jazz. And so I opened this door, there's 35 guys, you know, trying to do the jazz and stuff. Then I opened the other door, there's about four, and they're trying to play funky. And I said, you know what, if somebody came looking for somebody that maybe could perhaps play funky like me, I maybe, you know, recognize easier if I'm in that group of four. So I came up with uh, a uh, uh, equation, I guess you can call it, formula. You know, I, you know, I or we play two percent jazz and ninety-eight percent funky stuff, and that's 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 what I'm about. A labor dispute between Brown and his band led him to recruit a young crew who had been gigging in Cincinnati with King Records, led by the Collins brothers, Catfish on guitar and Bootsy on bass. They become legends themselves. Okay, so when Bobby Bird called, we playing. Um, at this club, having no idea that um, you know we're gonna, you know, James Brown is gonna call us one day. You know, I get on the phone with him, and he says, uh, uh, "Where's he? you and the boys? What are y'all doing? You know, we're playing a gig. You know, um, well, James Brown wants y'all to, you know, come play with him." I said, "James, Brown? you know." So I went through all the excitement thing, and and then it was like, well. We're on a gig right now. He said, no, nah, he wants y'all to come now. And so, sure enough, he showed up. And he had the limo out there, you know, and it's like, y'all ready to go? And he's like, I mean, we didn't have, you know, we wasn't, nobody packed. You know, we had on what we had on. And it was like, y'all got to come on now. First of all, he treated me like a son. He always was... You know, uh, you gotta do this, you gotta do that, you got, you know, which for me at the time was really good because uh, I'm a knucklehead from out in the street, so, you know, that didn't grow up with a father in the home. So I needed all of that. And I kind of knew that I needed it. And if anybody was gonna give it to me, it had to be Jane Brown, because <laughs> I wasn't going for it from nobody else. <laughs> so, James Brown, you know, he was perfect. He was the perfect father figure. Boozy Collins, hard welcome, Mr. Bible will, 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 will verify that. Boozy Collins was a star when he came, and I never took that away from him. He didn't understand the one, but we taught him that. Boozy Collins, he's like a son. So when we were in the studio, he would always, it was like he was on stage. Um, you know, he would have to show people that he was still James Brown. You know, so in the middle of a song, he would have to break out and do the James Brown, you know, and, you know, which wouldn't have nothing to do with what we're doing. <laughs> I guess that was probably the most funniest thing um, that would happen in a session. I remember James telling me about the one, um, and I thought that was just, you know, at first I thought, you know, it's like, why are you telling me this? You know, because I just want to play. You know, I ain't, you know, nobody got no time for the one. Now, son, let me tell you, you got to give me the one, you give me the one, and you play all that other stuff. Just give me that one. One, two, three, four, one, thing. I said, all right, you mean like this? You mean like this? We do, do. Dude, dude. That's it, that's it. I'm glad I thought of it. That's it. But that's uh, that's where Brother James was at. I mean, you know, and he taught me that. And when he taught me that, it was like I used that in every uh, thing I did. Now I got to find a way to get these people. So I got to play something they can't play. So it was on two and four, and we chip throw and all that stuff. You can't wash my father's bag. 
I put on one and three. And you can't waltz backwards, so you can't go down. You got to go up, see, so that stopped all that waltzing mess. But uh, it became the biggest thing. It went from two and four to one and three. Bootsy and Company's exit didn't stop Brown's funk flow. He'd go on to come funk classics like The Big Payback. But the age of Aquarius was dawning with psychedelic drugs, funky threads, and wah-wah guitars. Where Brown's funk had been rooted in the struggle, Sly Stone's vision was truly utopian. It was a movement going on. You know, it was a whole lot. It was, it was a few different movements going on. And it was a movement going on in music where uh, you're just coming out of this, this peace and love thing. Um, uh, and then we're going into um, this whole other, this whole other thing. You know, we didn't know what it was, but, you know, I think we were kind of at the forefront of it and a part of it. And so it's like um, bands were moving to the front of the stage. Bands were wanting to be the stars instead of playing behind stars. Jimmy and them had talked about it, you know, um, and he was probably uh, one of maybe the first that actually, you know, especially being black, that actually, you know, came to the front. Jimi Hendrix had come up as an R&B backup musician. So even as a guitar god, he never forgot the lessons of the group. Jimmy was the coolest there is. Hendrix is an R&B guitar player. So Hendrix really was steeped in rhythm and blues. He didn't appear out of just out of nowhere. And then people focus on him being psychedelic and taking LSD, and they even focus on him being a blues musician. But he was actually a rhythm and blues musician, and he also played in, you know, in rock and roll bands. Like he was played with Little Richard, he played with the Isley Brothers. He's, I mean, he started the band of Gypsies with the drummer Buddy Miles, who's already a star with the electric flag. And Buddy Miles is just, in terms of his rhythm, he's, he's an incredibly funky drummer. When he had Buddy Miles playing the drums, he had such a, a heavy backbeat behind him. And so it was, he was able to like just space out. Like to me, all of what Eddie Hazel and them was doing with Funkadelic, it's kind of based on that album, that one album, Band of Gypsies. So, you know, yeah, man. That was it. Like Jimmy kind of took, uh, he kind of took all this, that heavy backbeat that Buddy, that Buddy Miles was doing, and he took it out of space, you know. So it's like out of space blues or blues on acid. So to me, that's the essence of what funk is really about. The funky new vibe of music was felt by jazz icon Miles Davis, who ditched his GQ suits, plugged in his trumpet, and brought in Latin percussion to create jazz fusion. The thing about Miles Davis in particular was that, and the thing that lets me know that funk is just an extension of, of this whole black music story, right, is that the funk never scared Miles. You know, when, when he found himself in an environment where the musicians were playing funky style instead of a, more of a traditional jazz style, it wasn't like he said, oh man, I don't know what to play. It wasn't like it's a new language, I don't know how to talk in this new language. He started plugging his trumpet into a wah-wah pedal, which is a device that usually you plug a guitar into, so it goes wow-wow. Miles plugged his trumpet into a wah-wah pedal. We were doing exploratory funk, and that's really what it was, you know. And um, at the time, there was a lot of people cutting it up, but truth lasts. On the Corner was the first time the critics just actually this is horrible. I, I remember I read one review where a guy said it was voodoo music. Well, he was right for the wrong reason. <laughs> it was voodoo music. Uh, but again, some people say you have to wait for, uh, for an audience. You know, they talk about the music being ahead of its time. I never believe that. Music is for the time that it exists. We didn't have to wait for a new audience of listeners. We had to wait for a new creation of critics because we would play night after night and the joint is packed. Wow, see? And there was no album covers in jazz that looked like this when Miles did this, man. This is incredible, this blew people's minds. This was truly a record of its time and it created a huge controversy in the jazz world, man, because people, like Miles has lost his mind. A lot of, of Miles' fans, they just thought he lost his mind. Talk about what it did for young musicians. Uh, for young musicians, it justified the funk. The fact that Miles 
uh, was, you know, going in this funky direction. It justified. They were feeling the funk already, and they were oh, they were feeling like they had to make a choice. Am I going to be a serious jazz musician, or am I going to do this thing that's in my bones, this funk music? And Miles said, you don't have to choose. You know, he said, you should try to figure out how to combine the two. That's what Miles was doing. The hippie spirit of the age was transforming the values of black folks, just as it was white America. And forward-thinking places like the Bay Area, where the freak flag was flying high on the wings of psychedelic drugs and free love, a band would emerge that took Brown's funk and dressed it up in Garth's new outfits. Funk could be disciplined, but also hot fun. I'd probably say it's rhythm and blues with, uh, uh, with people that couldn't cuss, but they wanted to, it sounded like they wanted to cuss. It was like they had that edge on it. So you said, you said it, it sounded like rhythm and blues, but they wanted to cuss? Yeah, but you know that, it was a, kind of like, dong, dong, you know, they wanted to, you know, because I know I did. You wanted to cuss? No, I didn't want to, but the words were, I felt like, yeah. yeah I didn't want to go to get in trouble, but some guys I did, though, anyways. I had been in trouble before. <laughs> Apparently. James Brown gave birth to funk and then Sly raised it. Uh, he clothed it in another way. What, what Sly did was update it to contemporary sounds. He sort of married what was going on. He was a true true pop producer in a way, but then he took it the next step further and he was able to lock into the um, the element of the radicalism, of the Vietnam War, of everything that was going on in the 60s and 70s. And he was able to sort of put that in, in words and into music that made sense for everybody. So it wasn't, it was, it, anyone could relate to Sly. You cannot believe how badass this band is. And it, you know, but they're like this band where you look at them, you just think they're not even in a band together. It's like, but together, they are the most badass, just funky, rockinest, killing it band that you could ever see. Sly was a hippie West Coast band that had funk undercurrents that they played. Their, all their stuff was funky. It was funk oriented, but they also played pop very well. Um, but they had Larry Graham and and they had Sly, and they had his brother, and only those people played like that. That was chemistry of the highest order. When we saw them, we said, oh, shit. Sly's band, Family Stone, they were a multiracial band. Men and women were in the band. They had women that were also performing, playing trumpet. You, hadn't, you didn't see that before. It was another freshness. They didn't have tradition. They had traditional harmonies, but they also had um, different voices coming in and out. Almost every funk band was affected by Sly in that way. Sly's dress, the fact that the way he dressed began rippled out everyone. Everyone kind of looked like Sly. Sly was the, the pimp superstar daddy of the time and, and everyone kind of wanted to emulate him. And they did. The wah-wah paddle distorting the guitar sound, those frenetic bass lines, those turbulent drum beats that gave birth to funk modernism. And funk modernism to me is not simply an appreciation for how the music had to be ramped up and had to be so uh, multiple, so polyrhythmic and syncopated, but it was also about the themes, you know, uh, talking about urban existence, talking about stuff that polite R&B music would never touch. Sly's another one that can think it. He can write it out. So he was able to do the hot fun in the summertime, a real clever pop song, but he could also turn it over and do simple song. And thank you, and be funky as James or us or anybody else, and still have you know, slick ass puns or you know one liners. Holy shit! <laughs> they don't let it... Now, okay, yeah. Now this is to me, this is the ultimate funk unit ever. Number one, hands down. If if I were you know, if, if we had a chart system, my number one funk unit of all time, this is them. With Greg Rico and Larry Graham, this, this unit was just ridiculous. This is definitely the record of all time. And uh, yeah, this was the one, and let's see. Yeah, Stan, Don't Call Me Nigger Whitey, I Want to Take You Higher. 
somebody's watching you sing a simple song, Everyday People Sex Machine, you can make it if you try. That alone, this record alone, he didn't have to do anything else ever. And this record would have stood up to, to everyone else who's ever made music. So, genius record. And the blueprint, man. Sly. The blueprint. I look at this album and I see why I'm sitting here. What was like your goal when you started to make people just get along? It was kind of basically. And I thought maybe I thought maybe if I had like the like, uh, uh, the white people and black people and girls and guys all in the stage and we playing and we're having a good time, the audience would just have to get in that. There's, there's just no way to get around it. That's what I thought. And I thought I was right. Yeah. I'm looking for albinos now. <laughs> I mean, that's the only really legitimate uh, uh, minority group going on. Though he wasn't an albino basis, Larry Graham made a unique place for himself in human history just by using his thumb. Larry Graham was Sly's bass player when Sly first hit it, you know? Larry, he was a guitar player, so he really didn't pay attention to like traditional bass technique. And he had a gospel trio with his mom. Uh, his mom played the organ, right? And he's playing guitar, and mom was playing the bass with her foot pedals. Pedals broke, so he bought a bass, just temporarily until the pedals got fixed. You know, so he's playing the bass. Then the drummer didn't show up. So. He didn't even start slapping with his thumb. He actually just started with like, you know, just like, just hitting him, just hitting him. And then the slap, the slap came out of that. And then, you know, you can, you know, you have to do the, the, the thumb and the forefinger to get that octave thing happening. And then that started into the pluck, the pull off and the pluck and all that. Larry Graham uh, is one of the most significant bass players of all time because Graham uh, invented don't, 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 using his thumb to, to pop the, the thump, the strings, as well as plucking them. And it, it gave a much more percussive, aggressive sound when we heard it in the hood, all the bass players were like, okay, what is that? We didn't know if it was a bass or a guitar or a clavinet. Or, what is that? And my boy said, hey, man, can you play like that? I said, yeah, I can play like that. And I ran home. <laughs> and I was like, okay, let's see. And I didn't leave the house, man, until at least I had like a reasonable facsimile. <laughs> After massive pop success, Sly made a faithful turn away from optimism towards a dark, murkier side that, like Brown, stripped funk down to its essence. This is the, uh, for those who do not know, this is the record cover of Sly and the Family Stone, There's a Riot Going On, which was an incredibly influential um, record. I mean, he had albums preceding this, like Stand, that had, you know, Dance to the Music, that had bigger hits, maybe, in terms of singles. But this is really where I think you saw a, a, an artist that maybe you thought of as like a funk artist or artist, a singles oriented funk artist that made one of the most amazing albums and most important albums of all time. In my opinion, There's a Ride Going On it was sort of like a, a reality show or an accident that you couldn't turn away from. You know, it, as genius as it was, it's also very painful to absorb because, I mean, you're listening to a man's life come apart at the seams. Like, how does someone come from... Like, that reeks of, you can do it. You're, it's, it's, it's encouraging. They were, they, were, they were the utopian poster children of all that was beautiful, the civil rights era. How do you go from that to... I mean, Just Like a Baby is like one of the most painful songs to ever listen to. It's the sound of... It's just very depressing. What, what led you to make that, that particular kind of record? Because uh, there were a lot of riots going on. That's probably it. There were a lot of riots going on. All kinds of riots, too. There were racial riots, and then there were economical riots, and, and then just riots. Riot riots. <laughs> Wrong riots. You made the record a lot, uh, unlike an earlier record, you made it almost by yourself, pretty much. Yeah, I had to. Because uh, at the time, 
uh, people had other things to do a lot of times, and I'd just be stuck. I'd live in the studio, so when it, you know the part come up, I had to figure out. I just do it myself, but I put their names on it. <laughs> Why'd you put your names on it? Well, because I never, I never, I like you can go to a movie and you find out the guy's the director and the producer and the star and the, you know the, I don't like that. I don't. It's like so greedy. So I just put everybody's name on it anyways. You know the Beatles is for them, so so they like ungodly. Motown had a whole bunch of them. But they're all like one artist. Motown is like artists with a whole bunch of different writers, producers. Sly did that shit by himself. And and in the solitude of a of a of a, a, a camper, he had a studio set up in a camper, and he would go out there and lay this stuff down. Sly reinvented the sound of music on Family Affair by his innovative use of early drum machines. Sound is right to me. And then I'd break one, so I'd have to have about four of them, different sessions. And then you're not supposed to put, push the button, but one, one button at a time. And I would have about three or four, and I'd break, uh, I'd break rhythm machines every time I go to sessions. <laughs> you know, just to get them right, though, to get the right sound. So that particular, you broke like three or four drum machines making that record? Oh yeah, at least. Talk about, I mean, there's, uh, people have always speculated about um, what the lyric is about. Is that about man himself? Is it about a particular family? It's kind of a, um, the, yeah, it can be that. And then it's just a, uh, an idea that I thought everybody could relate to. And that's, that's kind of basically it. Fast forward, I get a chance to meet him. I said, what is family affair about? He said, Tunes, that's about me. He said, the lyrics, one child grows up to be somebody that just loves to learn, and another child grows up to be somebody you just want to burn. Mom loves the both of them. You see, it's in the blood. Was it both kids are good to mom because blood's sticking in mud. It's a family affair. His mother only called him uh, uh, Syl, Sylvester. Sly, they were in competition internally. Because he was one of those kids came up in the Holy Roller Church, and when he went that way, his mother and father hated him. So he was always in conflict. And as years later, I find out there's a lot of people who came out, brothers and sisters who come out of the gospel thing, that had that internal conflict. Well, there were two girls in the, in the house, and they were they were uh, active. You know, they would, they would argue, and then they would not argue, and so I left, and I went upstairs to the studio. That's probably a lot to do with it. Okay, so there was two arguing... There was two, there's two, they were sisters. Ah. One turned into my wife. Okay. And then she was... You know what I did at my uh, honeymoon? The very night, went to the studio. On your honeymoon night? Yeah. She probably wasn't too happy about that. No, it didn't seem like it. <laughs> <laughs> While incredible creativity was coming from San Francisco, an unhurled new home for funk was growing in America's heartland. In the 80s, a studio band called Lips Incorporated from Minneapolis had a hit called Funky Town. It was a cute record, but it wasn't accurate. Minneapolis would make its own contribution. But the true funky town was in another part of the Midwest. There, there was, there was a time where, where, where it seemed like Ohio was coming up with a new funk band every other week. Dayton, Ohio, is just down the road from Cincinnati, where King Records was located. James Brown recorded, and Bootsy Collins learned his trade. But from the late '70s into the early '80s. A city with a population of 300,000 was truly funky town. Producing the Ohio players. Slave. Lakeside. Heatwave. Zap. Roger. Platypus. Sun. As well as innovative musicians like Junie Morrison and Steve Arrington, which raises the question, why Dayton, Ohio?
Dayton, Ohio has uh, the highest per capita number of bands and musicians connected to the funk explosion of the latter 1970s. A uh, city that has inordinate number of bands that had record deals on major labels. But even those bands are also, you know, supplemented by the number of bands from that town that actually never really uh, got record deals. I associate funk and the funk band as emblematic of a period in which relatively high wage working class jobs just before the ravages of deindustrialization deplete so many of these towns. The funk band is really the product of that because most of the parents of these band members worked at Delco, they worked at factories, and they had enough disposable income to purchase instruments, to afford lessons, private lessons sometimes for their children. The whole scene developed in like the basement. It wasn't, it was a very, you know, centralized scene where the families um, between the car companies and NCR and Inland Steel, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base were making um, nice change. They all lived in houses, weren't really apartment buildings, so they all had tricked out basements. And they basically keep their kids off the street, would buy them whatever they'd want, and you would just go from basement to basement and just jam. So you play in a band like the Overnight Low Show Band, which was a very popular local band that constituted members that would go on to play in other groups. You were as popular as the best athlete for the school. You had a following. The talent shows and competitions at these schools rivaled major sports events as far as the attendance and also the seriousness was with, with which the competition um, was put together. The breakthrough for Dayton was a band known for its driving riffs and erotic LP covers. When I first heard Skin Tight, um, I remember the girl that I picked up the night that, that I heard the song Skin Tight and she was wearing skin tight jeans and the lyrics go you a bad bad missus in those skin tight britches running folks into ditches they about to bust their stitches damn after the ohio players hit everybody even got more serious because not only did the ohio players have hit records they were totally unique nobody sounded like those guys and it just kept getting deeper and deeper and deeper we generally wrote about things that were happening on the road. And at that period of time, people were streaking. In fact, on the Skin Tight album, we have a song called Streaking Cheek to Cheek. And that's because people in these college campuses where we were playing um, a lot of the time were running across these college campuses butt naked. And a streaking thing was out. So Skin Tight was the whole idea based around that concept of what was going on in the world. The cover itself was so suggestive, was erotic, was sexual, was challenging to a narrow conception of what the black body was worth and what it was about. And this is a very curvy woman of color so that the very cover of the album signified uh, what's inside. First, they were really shocking. I thought they were very shocking. I was like, wow, they put a naked lady on the cover. Meanwhile, of course, I was a young girl at this point, and, but I thought they were so stunning and they were so beautifully done and tastefully done. This was a great thing about um, conceptualists. This was the thing I think about people in funk music and combining stuff with fashion. It was, they were great conceptualists. I mean, Ohio players, album covers. I mean, can we, can we just, yeah. that's a moment in and of itself. Our concept was, uh, the band, if, if we could put on our album, A Beautiful Black Woman, we would have every man alive looking at it. And if they would look at it and they would buy it, then possibly they would put it on and listen to it. The Honey concept was just unbelievable. Um, when we walked into the studio and saw this girl laying on this plexiglass and they're pouring honey over her, it's like, what are y'all getting ready to do? It's like, you know, one of the, one of the biggest uh, and most 
anticipated things with us doing an album is to finish it, to see how the album cover was going to look. It was like, okay, let's finish this album cover called Honey and see where we're going from here. But um, The girl was, was really covered in honey. Really covered in honey. And after a couple hours of shooting, you know, shots and likewise, you know, you probably heard the story. She got stuck to the plexiglass. She really got stuck to the plexiglass. She really got stuck to the plexiglass. And we had to pour warm water over her and then pry her off that plexiglass. <laughs> I tell you, so that's people, not an urban legend. That's not an urban legend. That's the truth. Steve Arrington, a member of Slave and later Hall of Fame, would be a funk leader as both drummer and vocalist. I think melodically, we took things in a new place as we drew from the funk of George and the guitar nastiness of, of Sly, we sort of blended it and added some uh, melodic perspective of maybe a Stevie and more jazz perspectives. I never was known as a singer in Dayton, only a, a drummer. I sang with this uh, lounge band, the Murphys, and Ty Yellow Ribbon, you know, doing all the uh, 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 on my way to Vegas tunes, you know what I'm saying? Came back to Dayton, and I remember I uh, Slave then moved to uh, um, moved to Jersey, and then we went into the studio for Just a Touch of Love album. We had did the track, and uh, uh, the guy who was going to sing on it uh, wasn't in the studio for a while. And so we all took a turn at the mic and I was like, man, we feeling that, it's kind of strange. Steve Arrington, as talented and, and powerful as he is, he's also a brilliant experimentalist. Uh, he's someone that can do things vocally that are unacceptable. He can actually sing a song, make it sound good, and even be outside of the notes in the chord, but he'll, He'll skim over those notes, go outside it, and come back. Some of the kinds of things that some of the great jazz singers uh, were noted for doing. He brings that to funk, and it really comes to, um, I think, a kind of national spotlight with the song Just a Touch of Love. We made a serious stamp on the world of innovation in a small town to say, to be innovative and unique is powerful with just some guys who started in the garage doing talent shows. It just comes from cats, man, who just didn't give a flip and just say, we're gonna do it our way. If it goes and you hear the fret noise, so you hear the fret noise. Or if, or if Sugarfoot's, oh, child, oh, girl, so what? It is what it is. You know, and I'm going, yeah, 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 You know, everybody just did their own thing. Zap, led by guitarist Roger Troutman, led funk forward by embracing technology. The technological experimental savvy of Roger is also part of the reason why the group actually ends up surviving this transition from the 70s to the 80s. So Roger was doing things experimentally with uh, playing his guitar through a Leslie speaker cabinet to get a kind of different uh, uh, sound out of his guitar. He was doing those things early on. And he was somebody that learned the technologies that as the studio became more the space for creative genius and less the live performance stage, uh, he was able to make that transition. Guys have always been interested in, in like what's gonna make the, um, you know, how, what, what kind of things are available that are gonna bring novelty to the sound. So there's always been this, this interest in incorporating technology. There's a technology that's also connected to the development of funk music. Two things I would say, number one, the wah-wah pedal was deeply, had a deep impact. The other thing is the clavinet. The clavinet is a, was a keyboard um, that actually plucks strings that was made by Honer. And the, the clavinet was were, were D, the D6 clavinet. And the clavinet, uh, God, uh, you know, Stevie Wonder. I took more bounce to the house. That was the first time we ever, we didn't sample it, we just cut it and taped it together off of another song he had on the album called Funky Bounce. That little beat, that's in more bounce, I took that off. There's no sampling wasn't around yet. 
I just taped them together and taped them together till I got um, 30 seconds of that. Then I called Roger back in and told him to play. It was Wes Montgomery, or James Brown, and we sang more about the the answer. But then I had him sing the talk box on the Moog and on the guitar. So you got three part harmony on it. So it don't sound like a talk box. Dayton definitely made its mark on funk, but the hard streets of Detroit would be a home base for funk's most influential music mob. In the early 60s, a barber who specialized in processing hair was also trying to make it as a songwriter. He wrote songs for Motown in Detroit during the week and did hair in New Jersey on the weekends. His name was George Clinton. I was going down my knees and worked to Friday, starting in about 63. You come back to New Jersey on the weekend? On the weekend and work at the barbershop. <laughs> you wrote songs Monday to Friday and did hair yeah. And come back and do hair. And then we we got a, a hit record, I Want to Testify. Testify came out right at the same time Flower Child, Flower Power came out. So we got out there and got turned completely out. You know, we went to Boston and, you know, we was in Cambridge, we was over Harvard with the kids. They would get, get $64 to, to test acid. We didn't know what the hell they was doing. We was up there, we were trying to get with the girls. So you started dropping acid? So the next thing we know, we was out there, and all these little kids were running and laughing at us, but we was having fun with the young kids. And next thing you know, we was old ass hippies. The old school process specialist got an afro. But his hairstyle was as much punk as funk. I couldn't stay still. I cut holes in my afros. I had moons and stars and dicks and everything designed. In my, you know, and, and you know, before, long before people started cutting those designs in there, I was doing that shit way back there. You know, they were still wearing suits and I was wearing diapers and sh sheets, or nothing. The music was changing slowly and slowly. The record started changing slowly. And it went on that way to, to Boots that came into the group. Going up to the house, first of all, is kind of like, you know, um, uh, you get this, you know, the Adam family kind of thing. <laughs> so, you know, you get that kind of vibe first. And I'm like, okay, I'm cool. So I go up to the door, you know, and she, she say, well, come on in, you know. I go in, you know, and the whole place is like dark, you know, and, you know, got the black lights going on, you know, and I'm looking around, you know, no furniture. You know, I'm saying, dang, this is awfully weird, you know. Even for me, it's weird, you know. And uh, then I look over in the corner, and I see this sheet, you know, sitting over in the corner with some, with some some yellow uh, uh, chicken feet on, you know? And she said, yeah, that's George over there. I'm like, yeah, I figured, I figured that had to be George. So I go over, you know, and he, he says, sit down, you know? And I sit down beside him, you know? We start talking immediately, you know? And so, you know, um, uh, I was telling him about the band, and he said, yeah, I, you know, I know all about, you know, JB's, he said, yeah, y'all, and he was telling me how bad we were and this, that, and the other, and that he wanted to um, hook up. We need to hook up. So my deal with him was, okay, help me write some tracks for Parliament, and I'll help you put your group together, the Rubber Band. And he, he said, can you use that name? And he said, that's your name, Rubber Band. And we did Stretch It Out in New York, walking down the street. Stretch It Out and Among the News, he had a rubber. The whole song we had did walking down the street. Huh. Came back to Detroit and recorded it. You know, but that was the thing. Get him was a new sound. You know, then he got Maceo and Fred. So Parliament all of a sudden had what we call P Funk now. This funk dynamic duo will write many of the eras defining jams in a boat off in Miami in the infamous Bermuda Triangle. Boots and I went all the way to Bimini. You know, that's the Motor Booty album talking about number one Bimini Road. Well, I took them through that, and you go all around 
Bermuda Triangle and all those weird places. When we first started going fishing, I thought we were just going fishing for fish, which we call a lot of fish, <laughs> you know, but I started realizing that we were fishing from the universe. We had the studio going 27 hours a day, you know, and it was like, um, uh, I made sure, that's when I had to make decisions about, okay, are you gonna stay up and act a fool all night, or are you gonna make, act a fool until four o'clock, get maybe two or three hours of sleep, and then beat everybody over to the studio? I've slept for a few nights in the studio, yeah. We, we like I said, it was, it was a party for seven days, and we wouldn't, we say like needy, the song Needy took us a week to, to record. So we stayed in the studio for those seven days. No one would leave, maybe to go get something to eat, but everybody would take shifts, you know, next, next. And um, yeah, you'd be stepping over people. Folk, people didn't take baths, nobody washed up. And talking about funk, yeah, it was pretty funky up in there. A bath, you better get, come on in and soak in that, that doo-doo. Like I used to tell them, you know, the bass, I have the bass so loud that I want to be able to run my hand across the record and feel it. You know what I'm saying? I want, I want the funk so so strong up in here when you pick up the record and say, ooh, they were funky in the studio when they made that. Nah, it was crazy, you know? Uh, you know, you had to step over mugs, you know, this, that, and the other. But I kind of clocked in early, you know, but that don't mean everybody clocked in. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, I just, when George gave me that opportunity for some, something just clicked, it was like, okay, you got to stop acting a fool. It don't, it didn't mean I had to stop acting a fool. It just meant you got to, you know, balance this fool, you know, uh, because the fool was still in me. Uh, and to this day, it's going to always be there. But I had to find a balance to do what I felt I needed to do. We'd all be in the studio and someone like myself and Lynn, maybe in the corner singing, I got a string on my thing, right? And then George said, oh, I hear that song, I say again. And we would say, when I pull my string, right? And then he said, go put it down. It would happen just like that. Or someone over on the side like Boogie might be just hitting a melody. And that simple. And then he would say, put it down. So he was the funk referee, like the ma like a magnet in the middle of this. And all these energies and music and everything would be flowing to him. Like he would be kind of hooking up to you, right? And um, one at a time, we would all go and put those parts together. And George would just, all those parts that are flowing, the creative energies that are in that room. I don't know how he managed to remember it all at one time and then retain it. What do you think P. Funk and George's contribution was to me? What did he bring to the to, to the music that was new? Funk. So George brought funk, straight funk. He's just funky. Normally he's just a can. He can't. He can't help it. And what's really deep is he didn't know where the wine was at, you know. And that was that was funny too. And so, you know, I kind of had to show him where the wine was. I got, I told him, I got this from Chase Brown, you know? And he was so deep, you know, it was like, give it here, you know? Uh, he didn't care where it came from. It's like, give up the phone. Babusa had been to James Brown school. So he knew what it mean to be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one. He knew the essence of that. But once I realized that one was what it is on James' record. We just tried to, we, we got stupid with it. We want the funk, give up the funk. Oh, we, you know, we exaggerated it and clowned it from then on. And Bootsy had that, him and his brother, they had that same essence that they had on James, that lock. You can, you can, you can go to work by that time and you don't need no metronome with catfish. Well, the, the whole mothership connection theory was basically that black people were the first aliens and it tied into George's whole alien culture uh, 
theories and, and mindset that he was way into. So he basically took the whole Easter Island and, and all these various things that uh, Stonehenge, like who, the pyramids, who knows who built these things, okay? And he tied it into, I know who built them, black people who were the original aliens and came from outer space and blah, blah, blah. So he created this whole thing. They take all this kind of fresh 60s, 70s, uh, hard look at ancient artifacts and questioning the origin of mankind and put it to an incredibly funky beat. Um, because these are essentially kind of black nationalist ideas. You know, the idea of the Egyptians being you know, a, a, highly, uh, a highly advanced civilization, perhaps with extraterrestrial ties. I mean, that's a very bold notion. And at the same time, black folks are reclaiming Africa. And all that goes into what becomes P-Funk. At the same time, P-Funk is clever because it's a way to celebrate blackness without saying the word black. A lot of what happened with funk was high concept. Certainly the, the ultimate was the mothership, the mothership connection. The whole idea of a new consciousness that we arrived at through music was a big part of, was a big kind of organizing principle that showed up again and again. In my case, you asked me what made me go that deep into it with Digital Underground. I didn't think about it. I just am a product of it. I'm a clone of Dr. Funkenstein. That's in me, you know what I'm saying? That's in me just as much as ch check one, two, one, two is. So I can't help it. That's just how I think. One Nation on the Groove, Free Your Mind, Your Ass Will Follow. I was branded by that. Of all the great records that P-Funk had created, none of them had a bigger impact on the next generation than Flashlight. Flashlight, when that would come on, that, that was a game changer. You know, the second right. that would come on. Tell me, what, 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 what was it about Flashlight that was unique? Flashlight is just like, I, I, and to this day, I still don't know what I'm hearing. Like, it's, I'm a musician. I don't know what I'm hearing. I don't know what's vocals. I don't know what's synth. I don't know what's bass being played through a Mutron. I don't, I don't know what's happening on that track. And that says a lot, you know, it's, there's, there's a magic, there's some, there's some magic shit on there that's incredible. Brandy familiar with the harpsichord. He took classical music, so and he's got a perfect ear. So he learned very quick how to play and, and adjust the knobs while he's playing. Cause the you know, thing ain't got no mood, ain't got no notes of its own. You got to make them. Blend this, a little bit of decay, a little bit of sin. You got to shape the notes. Gucci had this track, but I mean, he didn't want it. And he gave it, he said, George, you take, take it. Said, That's what George says. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, listen to it, and everything else is me on that record, except for the vocals. You did all the instruments? Yes, except for the guitar and drums. It's a, a saxophone solo and vocals. I'm doing, doing the bass line. There's two other uh, uh, Moog synth. So that's three Moogs and the strings. I'm playing the arc string ensemble synth. So the strings, three synthesizers, and the rest is vocals. When you put it on loud and you're in the high school dance and someone's had a 16-year-old and they, your ass just starts to move. And for the first time, they played Flashlight on the radio. And again, that electrified feeling I got when I saw the Clones of Dr. Ferguson album, I held the radio knob for five minutes until Flashlight was over. And then I fell back like this. And my life again was forever changed. How could you make a record that funky? When Flashlight was out, there was parties where Flashlight would get played every other record or every three records all night. That was a hot record. I've only experienced like three or four records in my lifetime that was that hot. The success of the P-Funk Mob was part of a wave of funk bands that would have major hits, be musically adventurous, and have dynamic stage shows. Cool in the Gang out of New Jersey, BT Express and Grass Construction out of Brooklyn, The Barcades out of Memphis, Brothers Johnson, war out of Los Angeles. Then tons of bands started in one city and moved to others. 
Mays featuring Frankie Beverly moved from Philadelphia to the Bay Area. Cameo relocated from New York to Atlanta. Two of the biggest bands of the era made Los Angeles their base of operations. The Commodores coming from Tuskegee and Earth, Wind & Fire from Chicago. Earth, Wind & Fire brought funk as close to elegance as it could come. I talk about this all the time, like, you know, you, you kind of have like the guys who are you, you're either a Rolling Stones guy or a Beatles guy. And even though you love the Rolling Stones, you know, you kind of lean toward the Beatles. So it's kind of the same thing with Earth, Wind & Fire and, and Paulo Funkadelic. Either you're an Earth, Wind & Fire guy or you're a Funkadelic. And I love Earth, Wind & Fire. I love Earth, Wind & Fire. But I'm definitely a Funkadelic. But Earth, Wind & Fire, to me, the, just the whole the Afro-Cuban thing and, you know, Afrocentric. And just to me, the mysticism. I used to sit and, and like stare at all in all for like for hours, just looking at the pyramids and all that stuff. And my, my fascination with it to this day can be stemmed back to looking at those um, album covers back in the day. Earth, Wind & Fire was Bill Cosby. P-Funk was Richard Pryor. Both comedic geniuses, but that was the that was the difference. Earth, Wind, and, and, and they were both talking about cosmology but in a different way. There was a whole thing with Earth, Wind, and Fire. They were focused on Egypt. There was a kind of whole Egyptology and pyramid power, the past and the future being collapsed. You know, that, that was a big, a big part of it. It's about the, the belief that we owe our debt to other people and that the world has to be brought together in a multiracial fashion. The irony is, out of funk music emerges a kind of synthetic, collages approach where things are brought together. Think about uh, Earth, Wind & Fire, it's all about love. We into astrology and mysticism and we're a religion, you dig? So that was actually prophetic and that was pretty radical and cutting edge because you're speaking to these deeply Christianized black people uh, whose modernist worldviews are being challenged by this Afrofuturism, which is projecting our blackness into space. A leader in changing the look of funk was a vocal trio from my hometown of Philadelphia who went from the Bluebells to LaBelle. They were like way before Gaga and Lady Gaga. They were, to me, they were the originals of avant-garde ladies that just didn't give a flip. Plus, Patty could sing like Beyond. And Nona and those guys were innovators. You know, this was before Grace Jones. They told women it's cool to be yourself and to be, to be provocative and to be uh, uh, outside the box. We had started wearing uh, space-influenced clothing by Larry Legaspi, and uh, for that particular night, we wanted to, I guess it's called early branding. We did the show at the Metropolitan Opera House called, and we said, wear something silver. And we had nuns in silver, people painted their horses silver, had silver drawn carriages, Salvador Dali came. I mean, it was really a big night. One of the key figures in, in funk style is a gay Filipino man named Larry Legazi, who was a stylist for, initially he developed LaBelle's look, the extraterrestrial looking sci-fi women singers that was then adopted and he it went on when George Clinton's outfits and the P-Funk's outfit got more elaborate Legazi did that he also went on he worked also uh, with Kiss on the, on the rock side but this idea is interesting the thing about funk that it embraced freak, freakiness outsiderness so you have a, a you know a gay Filipino man who's unheralded in a sense but who's an essential part of creating the look of funk in the 70s they opened the door for that whole inclusion, you know, uh, 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 s s sexual orientation, none of that mattered. It was really, LaBelle had a more coming together in a, in a way than, than any other group that I, that I remembered up to that point. So you had the disco thing going on, but when they came along, it did this. So you'd go to their concerts, it'd be gays, straights, you know, doesn't matter. And uh, that opened the door for that to me, the LaBelle. The sampling of funk beats by hip hop artists created a new dynamic across musical generations. But sooner or later, somebody comes along, 
and takes it back to back to square one with the simplicity. It always gonna do that. And when it comes, people gonna say, "What's that? Get on the nerve? What is that? What is that? that? It's the new shit. James Brown, P Funk, then all the songs that had that raw." unprocessed, because you have a lot of room left, so you can process it yourself. Funkadelic have a song called Good Old Funky Music. <laughs> just a simple stripped down beat, but the way they, they recorded it, it just, they, it sounded monster to us. You know, we heard that and it was like, you know, oh my God, we could not believe our headphones, we couldn't believe the speakers. Um, it, it literally could shake the room. And then I think, you know, then hip hop art, artists, like ourselves had the idea of like getting a hold of those things and then, okay, turning the bass way up or at, or doubling up a, a kick drum or chopping it up to make it even move or, or make it even crunch even harder. Hip hop is gonna be deeply influenced by funk because they have similar preoccupations with repetition and circularity and vamping and taking a break beat and moving on. As art, funky drummer is the most important Hip hop break in in hip hop's uh, stratosphere, um, but I feel as though the 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 actual heart of hip hop lies within "Impeach the President" by a group called the Honey Trippers. "Impeach the President" is, I mean, that is black music's uh, "We Will Rock You," like just that that instantaneous. I know that drum break. Part of the funk, especially back then, when I first came out, it was really about its connection through hip hop. You know what I'm saying? So kind of like in that lineage is how we were reaching it. And so by the time I did Voodoo, whereas it's we're, we're kind of like not leaning as heavy onto the head nod thing, we smoke and had not hip hop thing, but it get more elemental. I credit sampling anyway. I know there's gonna be a great deal of controversy, but I'm gonna credit sampling because you know sampling took that essence, took that that rawness of the funk, and then put that back on the radio where it had been missing. I, I would definitely credit this to hip hop and um, uh, you know the West Coast, the G G funk type thing because those cats religiously are fucking with the funk. They're not fucking around. Every time I go to Cali, that's all I hear in the streets. And Snoop and Dre and all those groups out there. I mean, that's all they do. They sample Roger, they sample Cameo, sample all the old OP funk stuff. Everything was up for grabs. Jimmy Castor Bunch, JB's, whatever. It, you know, it, it was, it was kind of like then after 1989, you could never sample another James Brown record again because you'd heard it. So you've heard so many things that were just mined and, and used for so many hip hop tracks at a certain point, you know? So, you know, you had to get in on the ground floor. I mean, being the most sampled, not just by hip hop, rap, everything. It's all across the board. I thank God that they chose me. And um, uh, four or five music has gone by and they're still uh, using me for everything, all the major, most of the major uh, endorsements. I, um, I feel great about the whole thing. Y'all think James Brown is a hot catalog? Listen to this p -funk stuff. And it was really, like you said, I was more continuing what they were doing. I just felt like Digital Underground was the hip hop version extension of Funkadelic. Rap and hip hop have blown up and they're all coming to George. So I said, George, now what do you think about all this? And he says, remember that album, The Clones of Dr. Funkenstein? I said, yeah. He said, these are the clones. All of them. They're all the clones of Dr. Funkenstein. The sampling of funk beats by hip hop artists created a new dynamic across musical generations. I was in Andre Harrell's office, and Puffy came in and said, Tunes, man, I didn't know you were here. He said, look, I have this artist I want you to, you know, I want you to, to meet. He said, because I want to I wanna do a sample of uh, uh, Juicy Fruit. So he came in, and it was Biggie. So we met really, man, really, really nice young man. I mean, I, I really dug Biggie, man. And, uh, and then he thanked me for clearing, giving clearance, because they were, they were having trouble 
getting the records cleared. And that was the bridge into the next generation. They would just buy the gear and start figuring figuring it out. They started figuring out how to make music. They would start sampling. They'd say, well, I'll take good time. Since that already works, <laughs> I'll take that, put, put in my little sampler and make a little groove out of good times. And I was like, and all of a sudden my whole um, perspective on it changed because I realized that that they they wish that they could have had the knowledge. People who make records, like uh, DJs who make records, they have to buy vinyl or buy records and find little snippets that they like and add it. I don't have to buy nothing. Yeah, I bought this in 1977, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I, I can do it. it. But you know what? Hey, they stopped teaching people how to play instruments. What do you expect? People aren't going to stop being creative just because you take away their tools. And they go in and they dig. And I've heard people say to me, like, yo, man, uh, you know, I came to you through that Jay-Z record, dude, and I heard the original Weekend and Nice, oh, and I started getting into your career. Um, so, you know, that's really been cool. I, I dig, I dig where things have gone. Um, I understand the side of it that, you know, I guess when you looked at it also, you could look at it from this direction, and that is, well, but, you know, the people who made the music, we, our career was done. You've been sampled a lot. But do the artists, do you feel like the artists, uh, I mean, do, do they remember, are you, are you getting paid for, are they? Are they Sometimes they don't, but they, I'm, 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 uh, I'm thankful. They keep me alive. <laughs> you don't have any beef for sampling? No, I don't care. Well, are there any, uh... I may sample all them. And I may do that, yeah. Sample everybody that sampled me. I may even sample what they sampled. <laughs> and call it a sample. <laughs> you know, everything in the 80s became, you know, with technology, you know, it, everyone wanted to have this very expensive sound, sound, this big, lush, tons of reverbs, everything, big snare drum sound, everything, you know, perfect for the radio. It's all about getting on the radio. Funk music involves jamming and it inv really you know it involves like being in a in a rehearsal studio with a bunch of guys a guitar player bass player drummer you know brass section whatever that because you know there's not i don't know how much that, that just isn't around you know it's also expensive to do that you know rehearsing and and getting a, a real drummer in there with a bass player it's easy to just to program it you know so that's one of those that's, that's kind of killed it off i really think that the uh, technology in a way killed the funk band and which is something i you know i really believe that once a lot of those bands started using drum machines and replacing the, the drummers i think they lost uh, a lot of them lost their way i mean some of them like cameo i mean they made a sound out of it but some of the others didn't make a sound what we were trying to do with planet rock it was go in a different direction which was something we wanted to take the European thing of, of craft work and bring it to the Bronx. So, so basically, it wouldn't have worked with a dr drummer because that wasn't what the sound was. We wanted something very precise, very clean. They weren't really interested in anything but the funky beat, the break. And that's why when we went to do craft work, uh, when we went to do Planet Rock and we used the craft work beat, it was very specific that they wanted that beat repeated over and over. And a, and a drummer really couldn't get that, I don't think, you know, that, that it's very difficult. You know, all the drummers, they were calling me, oh my God, aren't you scared? We're not gonna have a gig. I'm like, uh, I, no. We just incorporate the drum machine and we play, find that space, and then find where we can incorporate technology with what we do live with, with uh, you know, drum machines. Uh, you know, you gotta figure it out. So I think it got to a point where some people couldn't afford to bring out these bands and after a while, if they weren't selling records, it got to a point where you had to, you know, put five acts on one show in order to sell the tickets. So, you know, the economy changed. It a lot had to do with it, you know. emerged out of the frozen north from a place that seemed too frigid for funk. But Prince would not only have massive hits, 
or founded a movement out of Minneapolis. Between his protégés like The Time and Sheila E., disciples like producers Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, and imitators from other cities like Detroit's Ready for the World, Prince's sound dominated the 80s and continues to reign. Slide of Family Stone, George Clinton, Paul and Funkadelic, all they were doing was taking black music and, and adding all these hippie elements to it, or at that time, psychedelic. So Prince and the time, they were kind of, they were doing the same thing, except the elements that they were bringing in were new wave, new romantic, that whole thing that was going on in Europe and all that, adamant type shit, and they were bringing that into, you know, rhythm and blues and funk or what have you. So it was kind of the same thing. He's a musician who plays funk and plays it very well. Brother was brought up in Minneapolis at a time when the, the minority population of that city was, was insignificant in numbers. Real clever song, right? I mean, he, he can copy and never use the same chords. He got a real good, he can do a purple rain if you, when it ended, purple rain, purple rain. It's country west as hell, but you don't relate it to that because he put a, a nice Jimi Hendrix t pretty tone over it on the guitar, which is really slick. He had to kill funk. And by him saying, we are a new dangerous sound, and that new dangerous sound was Chuck Berry. Their new dangerous sound was new wave, which was going back to early rock and roll. But he was not scared to make it dance music. Prince loved James Brown, there's no question about it. He loved Santana. And for all I know, he loved Led Zeppelin. Well, the thing is, is he created his own sound, you know, just like James and Sly and everyone else created their own sound. That sound was, if he, if all he knew was to play, because he produced and wrote and played everything himself, well, so supposedly he doesn't play horns, so if he played uh, keyboards, he's gonna have horn sound. He did everything himself, so that's why the sound sounded like that. He didn't kill the horns. He wanted to play everything himself, so obviously, well, I'm gonna get a horn patch, and this is what I would play if I had horns. And then when he could afford to have horn players, but then he brought in horn players and played. I mean, he's a great, making of horn lines, incredible, funky. He experimented, he used different sounds, some records, he didn't use any bass at all. That was unheard of. So he's like, there's no limit. One of the things about the way Prince recorded is that he, he had a unique sound to his drums. He, he used the drum machine, but he also used live drums. And he, he uh, also used keyboards in a very kind of a way that hadn't been used before. He was a real arranger, though. He was a real, I mean, he's a real, not just as a composer, but the way he arranged his music was, was very unique. Prince's Funk is all about, you know, deep snares, and if he does uh, uh, does use a crack snare, he turns the snare off. So his thing, his thing's more about, you know what I mean? Like it's more, it's a driving funk. I always put it this way: what I recognized when I was first around Prince and would come to rehearsals and sound checks and so on was that whenever he wanted to jam and just have fun, inevitably he would call a James Brown tune. He might play Body Heat for an hour and a half, or it's too funky in here. Those were two of his favorites that he would just jam on, and he'd, he'd play guitar for 10 minutes, then he'd sit down, and he'd go over to Bobby Zine, get him up, and he'd play the drums, and this jam would just go on forever, to the point where the crew and everybody was like looking at their watches, like, all right, already, let's go, we want to go home, eat dinner. And we just rehearsed them, we'd go on and on and on, and he was having a blast. Yo, the one figurehead that totally embraced the, the Chitlins era of, of James Brown, you know, the part that no one would ever touch. You know, rappers are taking all these funky drummer and give it up, turn it loose breaks and the payback and all these classic prime James breaks. But there's someone that actually took the James stuff that no one wanted to touch and made it into their own. And that person was Prince. Morris Day and the time were very much his funk alter ego. You know, certainly Prince trademarked a brand of funk that was fresh, 
uh, sonically fresh. The only thing that is on the one in 777-9311 is the hand clap. Everything else is all over the one. Like, it's, it's almost as if the, the silence of the one is the funk. And the fact that that song was a top 10 hit and digestible, easily digestible, I, I, it's, it's baffling to me. He seems to uh, have, a formula, have, have a, a formula that doesn't waver too much. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a little trickster he buys me of. You know. <laughs> it's, it's cool. Can, can you ask about one more person? Sure. Uh, Rick James. Yeah. Rick. Rick somehow. I hated that he did what he did. That's, that's what I think about. I hated that he beat up the girl. That's what goes my way. I hated that. He did that. Do you and think I, he was calling me every night to come over there? Come over to that hotel. I'll tell you what he said one time, and I didn't, and I didn't like this either. He said, man, hurry up and write a song so I can know what to do. Yeah, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to think that. Rick was a star. He enjoyed being a star. He had a star quality about him. He did some raw funk. He was very musical. Um, like that you and I joint, that's a, that's a bad track, but Rick could do it all, man. His persona, perhaps, it, 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 it did overshadow before it was all over with, but you can't deny the great music. That Street, street Life album, Three Songs. Three songs. <sighs> yeah, it's right, yeah. Yeah, man. It's a masterpiece. <sighs> the whole thing with him and Prince, mm -hmm. because, you know, he accused Prince of conceptually took this and then the girls and it's interesting the rivalry they had because because they were compatible talents mm -hmm. you know and Rick in his own way was one of the few people who could mess with Prince in mm -hmm. terms of the range of stuff that he could do and what if they'd have done something together I mean a Prince Rick record a Rick Prince record however you want to say it Woo! for many younger black musicians Prince was the bridge between Funk's traditions and a new technology savvy sound Indie Funkster Dame Funk studied records like 1999 to create what he calls modern funk. That's what I'm trying to take, modern funk. I call it modern funk because we continue it. I, I want to try to bring beautiful music along with the, the, the street beat on the bottom. The progression of funk was dying. We had a lot of tribute bands. I'm not mad at the tribute bands. They're very talented, you know what I'm saying? But I'm not a retro artist. I'm not up there going back to 1969. I think, again, he's pushing the boundaries. He's basically one of these people that was very highly influenced by funk music and wants to do it in the 21st century. And this is his interpretation of, of, of what funk music is in the 21st century what it has evolved into being. Dame's love of funk led him to create a long-running party called Funkmosphere that serves LA's vibrant underground scene. Steve Arrington was so inspired by Dame that he collaborated with him on his first new tracks in over 20 years. LA sort of feels like the way Dayton felt in the 70s with people not being afraid to try and do, to do different things. And that's why I've connected with that scene, to try and open up and say, hey, I want to be a part of this, sort of like a second movement. The future of funk, I, I think Dame's really kind of trailblazing, like, because there's not that many other people who are in his path right now. There's a group in Japan who I call the Japanese Dame Funk, and there's a guy in France who I call the French Dame Funk, you know, like, I think people are starting to pop up that sound like it, and it's like kind of a recognizable sound, like, oh, that sounds like Dame. I'm hopeful and, um, you know, pretty confident that it's, that there is going to be an artist that really reaches the kids. D'Angelo, to me, is one of the most awe-inspiring torchbearers of funk that I've ever known. We're brothers in funk. And I'll say that making the voodoo record was like one of the most enlightening educational experiences I've ever had. I mean, that changed the way that I 
thought about recording, that changed the way that I thought about engineering. When D sits down at a piano, it's nobody but D. And yeah, there's James Brown in it, there's Prince in it, there's Sly in it, there's George in it, because how can there not be if you've listened to this music growing up? But I don't think anybody else has so comfortably merged the classic elements of R&B and funk with the hip hop influence the way D has, and that's why it's fresh and contemporary. I think funk is dead in its own way. It's not what it used to be, but it's, it has morphed into something that's different in the 20th century, absolutely. It's totally different, um, and it's okay. From Brazil, the country that gave the world samba and bossa nova, the gritty favelas that surround the big cities, have generated their own brand of funk, baile funk. From West Africa, Funkalicious grooves called Afrobeat have been inspired by several generations of the Cootie clan, beginning with his legendary father, Fela, and continuing with his son, Shayun. Not only is 21st century funk global, but is deeply ingrained in the scene people think of as rock center. Jam bands may have been inspired by the Grateful Dead, but jam band icons Fish and Les Claypool are among the many that work funky rhythms into their winding musical excursions. It is some 60 years after James Brown made On The One, a musical commandment. Yet funk still continues to move feet and booties. What is its legacy? Well, I think funk is everywhere and nowhere at the same time. It's ubiquitous in that it still provides the recipe for the musical orientation. That is, we have not quite gone outside of the formula that James Brown and Sly Stone have given around syncopation, uh, around the one. Those things are so deeply entrenched, not only in black music, but in American pop music, that you can't get rid of it. The pillars of that dance music is funk, whether it's via sampling and taking something old, or it's just inspired and fueled by that concept of something gritty, something dirty, something that's making the, just the audience move and reactive in a certain way that's kind of almost beyond a mind or, or intellectual reaction to records. You know, it's just that whole, that the spirit of putting a record on and, and just having a reaction of bodies move, that, that's gonna just go on and on. I'm one of the few people uh, that does believe that funk has never left. It's, it's, you know, the ripple is just spread, you know, throughout the earth. Um, is it in America as much? No, but you know, everything must change. So it doesn't mean that I'm not a believer in it, you know, but uh, no, funk is, is still here. The one will never go anywhere. You know, it's like, the funk will be the guest of honor, but it always will bring somebody with it. So, what name should I put down to get into the club? Funk, well, funk plus three guests. It's always gonna be funk with some other form riding out, and I think whatever form that is uh, may uh, succeed it, but it will never uh, eclipse it, because the funk is the fundamental structure of our existence when we fight against nastiness and when we celebrate ecstasy at our heights. Man's natural state is funk. If you don't wash, don't brush your teeth, or splash on cologne, you will be funky. So when we say funk, we're not talking about simply music, but the unfettered essence of men and women. So funk never dies. It is eternal. It just smells a little different from time to time. <laughs> <laughs>